Okay, so today I want to talk about uh, the great master designer of living systems, namely evolution. Evolution works uh, with really one tool, namely um, through the sequences of proteins. Sorry yes? to interrupt. Uh, is this aquaporin 1, aquaporin Z, or another variant? Mm, just to wait. There will be many aquaporins. So there will be hundreds. Oh. OK. So, so we will be talking about the great master of, of uh, you're like this guy in this, uh, what is it? Uh, Big Bang Theory, one of them. OK, good. But anyway, so um, we work through the sequences of proteins. And, uh, and now we want to show this a little bit. And uh, aquaporin is a, great, uh, is a great example. Uh, it's not working, sorry. I have to somehow. Uh, we are out of tune here. Let me see, I have to choose a different. Maybe this one goes a little better. the better revolution, but it doesn't tell me how to do it. Okay, maybe I've, maybe... This looks better, yeah. Okay, let's hope it works here. Yeah. Okay, now. Okay, I thought it get the full picture. That's what we want to get. Okay, so uh, proteins are made of sequences, those are the carriers of all functions. Living, uh, living systems are really an ensemble of uh, biomolecules where the proteins are the ones that are being molded by evolution through the sequence. And that's what we want to talk today. And the example that we, that we will be looking at is uh, the protein aquaporin uh, that uh, divides uh, through the membrane and one aqueous space from another aqueous space. And it has inside, uh, we just sort of open the protein here, a channel that conducts water, uh, but only water molecules, not protons, uh, the positively charged water molecules, or negatively charged water molecules, only protons, and actually some other important uh, substances, um, namely linear sugars. Okay, so uh, and now we would like to get a little bit of that information that, uh, that tells us about how proteins are made, what are their amino acid sequences. So we took it at a given so far, but today we want to look a little closer. So here's a little bit of an 
agenda. Right? This is an extremely important field. I want to read it to you now, but basically through the sequence, evolution molds uh, physical properties of the systems and thereby can get an evolutionary advantage, grow faster than the competition, and thereby uh, sort of mold uh, the molecular makeup. So uh, this is a process that happens in evolution. And um, it is just like the history of, uh, of life on Earth. And it is very much like human history in the following sense that if I show you here the, um, the, uh, the family tree of uh, Charlemagne, and then you see that he was uh, uh, emperor in, uh, in Europe, and then he had uh, children, and they had children, and then got married, and uh, they uh, had offspring, and the offspring is the history of uh, this particular nobility, a uh, very important nobility uh, uh, in, in Europe. And so we have something very similar in, uh, with protein. So you can think of these uh, offsprings as, you know, some people were very tall. Charlemagne was extremely tall guy. I think he was about two meters, which was in 800, around 800 when they lived, really tall, whereas uh, and one of them is actually called the short one. I don't see it now. Oh, here, the short, Pippin the short. His son was already very short. So, uh, so you know, you're getting all kinds of characteristics uh, when you are uh, changing things in history. And that happens also to proteins. And so the proteins that are called aquaporins are actually uh, forming similarly a history. You may call here one aquapore in the middle the ur aquapore in the proverbial first one. Usually it's very difficult to trace back to the, uh, in history to who was really the first. Uh, but, uh, but then you, you see that how they, they divide up into families. And uh, the families are defined by here. Here we have uh, distances uh, in, in the family, you know, that the children from one father and one mother uh, you would call closer, and then you have, you know, cousins and second cousins and third cousins. Uh, you're getting a spread, and similar, you get a spread uh, in the proteins, but uh, of course, they don't, they don't have uh, brothers and sisters and cousins. They have mutations, changes in their sequence, in the amino acid sequence. And so you are now dividing up the family tree uh, by the number of mutations that uh, differentiate uh, the proteins. And so you see here, if you compare here, these proteins, they are rather different from these proteins. There are more, more changes here. They form some kind of family. And when you look at these families, you find that they're actually often functionally related. So we will see that actually in a second, but I may tell you already that here we have aquaporins that live up to their name, namely to conduct water, whereas here we have uh, aquaporins that uh, also conduct water, but they also uh, conduct glycerol, linear alcohol, that is uh, helpful in, the, um, in, 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 in basically all life forms uh, for the purposes of energy. And uh, so we are getting most of our energy from um, eating food and uh, burning it uh, in a process called respiration. We have to breathe air for, to do that. Um, but when we are, for example, going on a, on a, on a very tough uh, uh, run, a marathon, then after a while we might have used up all the food stuff that was available to us, we still need the energy, and then we revert actually with ourselves the more primary uh, a form of getting energy, and that is actually from linear alcohols. It takes sugars or, or uh, starch molecules or fat molecules in our body, we turn them into sugar, and the sugar we turn into uh, glycerol, which are short sugars, uh, just three carbons long, 
and uh, those are then the, 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 the molecules that can be turned into food, into the energy of ATP, just the way we saw that other organisms fuel the cell by synthesizing ATP, uh, so you can use this kind of molecules as a food source, so they are very important to transport. Yeah, here you see that, exactly what I just told you. So we have here the one for glycerol transport in yellow, we have the water transport in blue, but also many aquaporins conduct actually gases. And so uh, small gases, uh, just a few, usually only a few atoms, and uh, so this is a function. And uh, now uh, when aquaporins were discovered, and then um, uh, people thought you must be making a joke uh, to conduct water across membranes. Water goes across membranes by itself. You don't need a protein for that. Uh, but the guy said, look, uh, if I have this aquaporin, and, and it seems to be conducting water, if I put it in there, it's, uh, water conducts faster. If I don't have it there, water conducts more slowly. Now the people who were so critical of, uh, of uh, um, of this uh, gentleman, uh, were a uh, uh, little stupid, but maybe I was even among them, I don't know, uh, um, because in nature it's, it is not that you can do something. Na what is very important in nature is you can control something too. You can do something and you can control it. And so what the water uh, um, the channels are about is they can conduct water faster, then other, uh, then you have normal leakage in membranes, in cell membranes, and thereby they can control how much water is where. So they pay sort of a price, you have to put the valves bigger, water goes, maybe you don't even want it, but control is really cru crucial, and you rather pump than water somewhere else away, but you are the ones who tells how much water is where rather than some random physical process. So we see then we have these functional, uh, different functions, and they are being uh, related to the family tree, to the change in, uh, in amino acid composition, and that is, uh, of course, reasonable, because you can imagine that certain proteins that have a certain similarity might be designed for glycerol transport, whereas uh, others that are more that can only conduct water might have some other specialty, and so there might be some kinship in terms of, uh, of distance between the amino acid sequences. So here's just an, an argument, why do you need uh, um, uh, linear alcohol? So we, we usually uh, use sugar or starch that we turn into sugar as an energy source, and so uh, what you do is, is actually you want to get ATP out of it, but initially, just like when you are making, uh, having a fireplace, you want to make it nice, warm, first you have to invest actually energy to, to lit the fire. So you have ATPs that, uh, that help you actually to take the sugar apart. And then you see there is now a cleavage of the sugar. And now we are getting these smaller places. And here we have uh, you know, one of these intermediates. And you see the glycerol that is conducted is sort of one of these standard uh, alcohols with three carbons. So they are the standard one. You can very quickly uh, turn all these kind of intermediates into glycerol. And here, when you look at the reactions, then the enzymes that are involved in, in the reactions are actually producing ATP as the reactions proceed. So here we are putting actually a small number of ATP inside, and we get much more out. And usually we, we, we are doing it uh, from starting from sugar or starch, whereas you have a shortcut, and you can add glycerol, and then you get uh, you get the energy a little faster because you're using already one uh, processed kind of chemical that's closer to the ATP synthesis. So. Um, here are now sequences of, uh, of, of, of uh, aquaporins, and uh, if you think about it, I would ask you, what kind of organism do you think has the most number of aquaporins? What would you think? What was the question? Which organism has the largest number of aquaporins, different aquaporins? 
So here we have human aquaporins, aquaporin zero to aquaporin nine, and, uh, and now uh, uh, plants. So humans have 10 different aquaporins. There might even be one that we didn't discover yet, but it's unlikely because we don't know the whole human genome, so we have 10. Whereas uh, plants have uh, typically 35 because they have to conduct much more water, they have to control water flow much more, and so they are really full of them. So here are the humans, and you see that, uh, that you have here sort of a comparison of these human aquaporins, and you see then here some red lines where you see that all the aquaporins that have been aligned, the human aquaporins, have, um, have here a glycine, and here also a glycine, here proline, here they have an aspartate, so there's a certain similarity. You call those the conserved amino acids, which you find only after you arrange them. It's not so trivial because you see sometimes uh, some human aquaporins are shorter than the others. Here are amino acids missing. And, uh, and so you see that, yes, you can compare uh, different sequences, but it's not so trivial. You have to learn how to do that. You know, sometimes you have to say, ah, this aquaporin lost a few. Uh, how can you tell that? Why don't you just move everything over? Yeah, you move, if you move it over, you lose a lot of similarity here. And so then it, it's more like, you know, this one has a shorter neck, but it's a belly and the head is sort of the same. And so they agree very nicely, but there was just a shorter neck or some other pieces that just turned out to be a little shorter. So it's not a trivial thing how to compare the two and, uh, and uh, how to compare two or more sequences. Okay, so why do, why do humans have a different aquaporin? Do you have any, any idea? The one is uh, obviously known to graduate students. Uh, when you cry, the professor gives too tough of a homework set. But in your eyes, you have aquaporins. Um, not only because you cry with tears of sadness, but uh, you, you also, your, water, your eyes need to be always watery, constantly have a fluid film that, uh, that, uh, that, give them, that, that keeps them functional. Another very important aquaporin you have in, uh, in the lung. If the lung would be dry, so the, the, the tissue of the lung, you couldn't breathe for, for oxygen exchange. You need a wet surface. If you don't have a wet surface, you can forget about it. And uh, a really important class of aquaporins you have in, um, in the kidneys. There are actually several aquaporins, because the way the kidney works, it, it, is, uh, it is first, uh, yeah, okay, so the way it works, it, is, uh, it basically filters uh, uh, salt out of, uh, out of the liquid system in our body and, uh, and keeps of water so that we don't have to drink all the time. If you have problems with your aquaporin in your kidneys, you might be constantly on the bottle and drink all the time. So here are the human aquaporins. So you have, for example, one aquaporin uh, that I find actually personally the most interesting in the lens of the eyes. The lens of the eye is, uh, um, is an uh, crystal clear thing. So if you go to the slaughterhouse and you're getting an, 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 an eye of, an, uh, of, an, uh, of a cow, you really don't need it for anything. You can, you can take it and now you can look at the eye. And one of the most interesting things you can do is you cut out with a sharp knife the lens of the, of the cow eye. And you see it's a beautiful lens, very clear. And you put it up and down and your finger becomes thicker and smaller. The way you move it is perfect. But then you take it and you squeeze it a little and boom, it becomes milky and you cannot see through it anymore. You cannot repair it anymore. So it just contains itself in a state that it doesn't diffract light, and then it becomes actually a lens with a certain, I mean, it diffracts light with a certain diffraction coefficient, but it doesn't, like, it doesn't have this diffraction like, like, like milky substances. Yeah, but if you look through your skin, you cannot even look through there. What's the difference? Now, one of the reasons, one of the differences is that skin tries to absorb uh, radiation uh, to protect itself, for example, uh, against cancer. 
and, uh, and so it's often pigmented on the outside, of course, with pigment because of the solar radiation. But even inside, it's heavily pigmented. But, uh, but um, another reason is the, um, the, um, uh, nah, the mitochondria of cells. The mitochondria of cells are uh, a size that is just like a wavelength of light. And so when you have, um, when light goes through a cell, it is diffracted at the mitochondria, and that makes the cells uh, milky and uh, not transparent. And so the lens cells don't have mitochondria. And so that, that is why they are so clear. Uh, but if the mitochondria in cells are needed for, your, uh, for energy, that is where you are burning your food. And so the cells in the eye, uh, in the lens, uh, uh, cannot have mitochondria, so they need glycerol. And so they need to have, they are basically a super one cell, there are many, many cells, but they, are, they have aquapoints all over the place so that they can distribute glycerol so that all of them get the energy from linear alcohols rather than from the, from the respiratory process in the, in the mitochondria. So that is, uh, there. the red blood cells are changing there as they go through big arteries and small, um, uh, 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 small blood vessels, they have to constantly change their volume. Like they're blown up like a balloon, and then they have to become shriveled to the smallest possible size to get to the finest t uh, uh, vessels to, to, to reach uh, with the oxygen uh, all muscles and all tissues. And so this process requires that, that um, blood cells need to pump themselves full of water and have very little water. And the kidneys and the eye, the epithelium of the eye to keep it nice wet. The brain, our brain is, is, is floating in water. If we would take a, put a little faucet here and go out, the, the brain would collapse into itself. And so there is a lot of control of that uh, uh, there. I told you already we have different aquapoints in the different kidneys. So you see aquapoint 2 in the kidney, aquapoint 3 is in the kidney, aquapoint 4 is in the kidney, salivary glands, uh, tears, and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So, so you, have, uh, you have a lot of them. So I want to show you how they look like uh, in, the, in, in the lens. In the lens, you have one supercell. So you have here a membrane that divides one lens cell from the next lens cell. And here you see that the aquaporin, the aquaporin is actually, they don't form one channel, they always come as a tetrama. So they always form four channels. Why they are, I will tell you in a second a little bit about but So they come over as four. So you see two then, the other two I don't show here. And now you see they also dock together. So that the channel goes actually straight through from one lens cell to the other, so that the water as well as the linear alcohols can go straight through the cell. Okay, so here we have this mystery that they conduct water, no, no protons. If they would conduct protons, they would discharge themselves, lose their cell membrane potential, and then lose all the energy. So, so they basically, the aquapoint makes the window wide open, Water, neutral water can go through, uh, charged water, protons, uh, 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 OH minus, no, and uh, linear alcohols can go, but no other molecules. Very, very interesting, and of course, one would like to understand how they can select this. So the, the trick is that they, have, they are just like at the airport, you have a really great selection, at, uh, like in Chicago, except when they have really tight selection in Chicago, they have a big like, queue waiting there, where they have no queue. They, um, they are doing it so fast, even though they are very selective, <coughs> that, uh, that nobody has to wait. Okay, so, so good, so. Okay, so now let's, um, let's look a little bit closer at an aquaporin. So there you see one of the monomers of aquaporin. I told you already made of four. And, uh, and, uh, and they have an, an overall um, symmetry that is uh, reflected actually in the amino acid sequence. And that symmetry that I will, I will show you to later, we don't understand it quite now, 
is that you need to conduct water, but you have to prevent the conduction of ions. Now, if you have a neutral pore, uh, ions can go through. Maybe not so well, but they can go through. If you have a if you have a pore with a with an uh, with an vectorial character, let's say electrical field goes in one direction, then some ions will go in that direction, others will hate it. And that gives you now the idea how you can make an, 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 a channel that doesn't conduct ch uh, charges. What you are doing is you are giving it a quadrupolar uh, 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 channel, where, where half of the channel has a dipole in one direction, the other half in the other direction. And that is what we have here. We have here a very, very strong electrical field inside the, the channel that is oppositely arranged, namely in a quadrupolar form. And that comes actually from the sequence. We have the sequence that, are, that is just opposite. They are just opposite to each other. They have this opposite symmetry. And that is how they work. So you see here the beautiful reflection of sequence and physical characteristic that you can see very nicely in the sequence. You find that, 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 that you call them actually, uh, what do you call them in, in, in the English language when you read forward and backward the same. Uh, what is it? Palindrome. palindrome. So there's this palindromic kind of character overall. It's not a strict palindrome, but sort of roughly. Okay, good. So, so here's how they are made. They are, uh, they are four. Um, for uh, 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 um, monomers, make one, uh, one, um, one channel, four channels. One here, one here, one here, one here. Looks like this is a channel, but if you look at it clo more closely, just with the VMD, you can see that very quickly, then this channel is very, very narrow. Here it looks narrow, but the rest of the channel is pretty wide. So there's some narrow point. You see only the narrowest point when you look, but the rest is wide, like a little door there, but big channel, big channel, big channel, big channel, very narrow channel. Here they conduct gases. And uh, there's actually many, particularly in signaling, you're using a lot of, ga uh, of gases for signaling, and so, uh, and so uh, very important. For example, plants have to exchange gas if they, they need that a lot. Uh, so here we have a big channel, but here we cannot get any real water or anything through except, you know, really very, very small um, gas molecules. And why do they make a channel? Why don't they just make a, a why don't they are not monomers? They're in a membrane. That means that this piece and this piece and this piece and this piece, they, are to the, they go to the lipids, they are, they are hydrophobic. Whereas here, they are hydrophilic. Now you say, oh, yeah, make it all hydrophobic. But then you, if you would be in, 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 in an evolutionary master designer, then you ask your friend, you know, oh, why don't we do that? And you say, oh, don't do that, don't do that. Why not? Don't you know hydrophobic proteins easily aggregate? Don't you know about Alzheimer and all these diseases where the proteins misfold and aggregate? Those are all the, the hydrophobic proteins. Don't do that. Try to have the minimum hydrophobic and that you can get along with. And then you're getting a, a design like this. You have here hydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophilic. So just a very good compromise. And uh, you also, maybe you gain stability, and you gain a fifth channel for the gases. So this is uh, uh, this is uh, basically the, the rationale for how they make themselves. So now we would like to learn to compare them. So we we, we talk about the humans have ten, and uh, and we want to now learn to compare them, and this is now the first exercise that you actually will have to do in the final. So the homework set on this is in part of the final. And so here we load into VMD one of the aqua points. So 1J4N uh, is one of is a protein data bank uh, uh, sequence, and you type it in, and this is what you get. Now you want to get more aqua points. You want to now align with it. Um, a second, a third, a fourth, and maybe more. 
And so that you can do readily. And here you're getting four different aqua points loaded. The one I mentioned already, and then these other three. So one is from cow, one is from human, two aqua, two, two glycerol, uh, two, two, two E. coli uh, aquaporins. And uh, so you have them here. But here you cannot compare them. Well, you know, they maybe even on top of each other, you can put them to the side. You want to really align them, bring them together as close as possible. And now obviously you have two, two criteria to do that. One is you look at the structure. You see them already, they are sort of similar, the structure. So according to the structure, you can align them and according to the sequence. So you can use both. You can just do it by the sequence, no problem. But you know, you throw some information away. It's always best to use all the information you have. So VMD can do it by structure, it can do it by sequence, and it can do it combined. Here we do it combined. And, uh, and so we do this, and here they are. Here you see how they, how they are sort of on top of each other. And you see that in the membrane where the, where the channel conducts, you see they align pretty well. We have on the outside yeah, differences, and that's something to do with the control of the of the proteins. They have they're controlling the loops. For example, uh, um, plant aquaporins uh, they have a flap on top that if it's outside too dry, they don't want to get any water to the outside. They just close the flap, and, uh, and no water goes through the channel. So they have a loop here that can just fold onto the channel, the channel is somewhere in the middle, and closes it. So the loops are sort of like the, the, the control elements, and depends on where your aquaporin is in the human body, or in the plant, or in a bacterium, you might want to have different control. So they differ there, whereas in the center, where they all just basically conduct either water or glycerol, they're very similar. Now that's uh, very good, but you want to have a finer look and look a little bit closer. And so now what you can do is in, in, in VMDs, you can, you can color them not by you know, the identity, where the red one, the green one, the brown one, I think, and the blue one. And now we want to color them by structural similarity. You call this semi local similarity of structure the Q value, whatever it is, and don't want to go into it now. And now you see by Q value, uh, and you see here that, uh, that we have here in the middle bluish and greenish. Now the color is all, only about agreement in structure. And we see here we have close agreement. And here then outside, we're getting more reddish values, very red here, very red in this loop. And there we have a lot of differences. Now we can also ask, where are the same amino acids? And so here you see that we have, here's a sequence actually, so the window in, in VND shows us both the structure and the sequence. And here you see we have amino acids that are exactly the same in all of them. We call them the conserved amino acids, and so we can plot them there. And so that's what we do. And so this is not plotted yet. We just rotate it to look at it from the top, because if I now put in the, the, the conserved amino acid, you will see immediately where they appear. What do you think where they will be? Guess now. Oh, the conserved bits? Yeah, where do you think there will be more conserved? Where do you expect them? The constriction? Well, I guess. Yeah, where here? You, you tell me cold, hot, hot, cold. So I go here. I don't hear anything. Getting warmer, warmer, warmer. Oh, you're hot, right there. Good, very good. And now cold again. So here, here is very good because that's where the function, where the channel is. Very good. So, so here you see, in the middle are the yellow guys. If I rotate it around, then you see there, in fact, inside. But then there are a few on the, on the surface. You see there, we, 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 we plot just one of them. This is a tetrama. And you see that we have some yellow spot on the surface. Why? I told it to you already. 
for the interact with the other? For the interaction, you want these guys to, to find the other guy, and so you are giving them then, you know, specified interaction spots, so they have to be, once you have some good interaction spots, you don't want to get loot of them during evolution, you keep them because they're so good, and so you find them also some conserved element there. So we have some conservation in the center, and we have then some conservation on the interfaces. And so, uh, okay, so, so that makes a lot of sense. Now, um, now we would like to sort of look a little bit at the physical characteristics. We are looking at physicists there, and, uh, and then we look at the, at the sequence properties. So let's look at, uh, at the physical characteristics. So here we see um, a membrane, the reddish stuff are the lipids, and here we, we, we differentiate the, the, uh, the protein by these colors. And here, this one, one monomer, we put gold, and the water we put in blue. And uh, you might think, what, a, what an awful choice. But we got actually a first prize in, uh, in, 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 in scientific illustration for it. So people like our choice of colors. So don't be too critical. So, but you see here very nicely that there is one water channel, and of course there are four others, and so they define very nicely where, where the system conducts the water. And now you, uh, now you can do an experiment where you can change uh, the water pressure that you, are, that you are putting the water pressure so that the water have a tendency to go in one direction. You can do that uh, experimentally, and you can do that computation. You can compare the two, and then you find that the comparison is actually very good. You find here that uh, here the pressure change. This is a water current, and you're getting really the measurement and the, the line from the, from the simulation. They agree that ni very nicely. But now you can. You also want to know why? Why do these water molecules uh, conduct uh, only water and not uh, not ions? And uh, the reason is actually um, that uh, that that the problem is not to prevent a charge sitting on the water that is conducted through. That's not the problem because. Uh, you just put in certain areas in the, in the channel that, that make it difficult for the charge to go through there. That's, that's not the problem. The problem is that we have here a train of water molecules. And I don't know if you've seen this, this movie, uh, uh, Polar Express, or some other movies where there are guys going on the train. And I think Polar Express, even the guy skis on the, on, on the train. Uh, and so, um, so you can you have a running train, and you can, however, get even faster uh, by uh, going from one uh, from one car to the next car. And so, this is what the protons actually do. The, the, they, these these water molecules can give one of their their hydrogens in form of a proton to the next one, to the next one, to the next one, and with almost the speed of light, the proton can go this way very very fast through. And almost no change. If you look at it, it looks like pretty similar. But in reality, if you look really, then you find when they do that, each water molecule uh, changes uh, its dipole moment. And so one direction is, is, is uh, conducting proton. One direction is good when you have a certain electrical field, whereas conducting this direction is better when you have another electrical field. And now look at the water molecules. The water molecules, they have with the oxygen down, and now look there with the oxygen up. So they go like this, and then they rotate around, and then they go like this. So that is exactly this uh, quadrupolar field that induces this kind of orientation. So the water molecules really twist around at this point, and, uh, and that is basically the secret of the conductivity of the system. So, uh, so here you see this idea. You see that how they turn around, and now here you see this mechanism that I told you. Here are the water molecules when they tran when they transfer their protons one to the next. Then first they have a dipole moment in this direction, 
And then they, after they transfer the proton, then the dipole moment is in the opposite direction. And so, uh, so in this in this quadrupolar field, none of them are good. This is good on one side, but not on the other side. This is good on the other side, but not on the one side. And so this is how nature really um, found a really great trick to, to prevent this from happening. Okay. So uh, how about now this uh, this glycerol? So here we have a here we have a an, uh, an a water channel in a membrane, and uh, so we fill it up, and now we add glycerol to it, and at the end we have actually quite a few of glycerol. I don't, ah yeah, we see them. It's, maybe we can even turn off the light a little more for just a little bit. So you see then here uh, there are more glycerols. You see sort of like the, the resolution here is so bad that I don't even see it from, from close up. But, uh, but uh, maybe when you look at the PDF file that I sent you, you see them a little better. But so there are all these glycerols. They are soaked with glycerols. This was actually a collaboration with crystallographers and, uh, and, 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 and computational people. So we, knew, we know where every glycerol is through crystallography. And so, so it's filled with glycerol, and now we know how they move, and now we can just look at one glycerol. So we had we soaked the glycerol, each of the channels had three glycerols, we had 12 glycerols, but we saw how the 12 moved, and now we can say, okay, how would one move when it wants to go from one side to the next? And you see that, uh, that the glycerol moves actually uh, along here, we see sort of like snapshots, and they move along a long uh, piece of the protein that is like an, like, an, like an alpha helix in blue, except the opposite. You take the alpha helix and now you twist it in the opposite direction that you're getting the opposite helix, hel helicity. And so this, he this helix depends on how you go, but if you have a certain direction, it's sort of like right-handed, and this one will be left-handed. And so this costs a lot of energy to make, but, uh, but it's a very good guidance because here the, 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 the amino acid backbones that are the strongest part of the, of the protein are to the inside of the helix, whereas here they are to the outside making contact. So here the backbones are here, and so these guys can, can use it as a railway uh, to, to, to move down. So you have these side groups. You, everybody talks about the side groups that are pointing away from the helix. But in some cases, when you have a very precise information, you actually do the biology with the, with the backbones of the, of the protein, not with the side groups. And then you want to get them inside out, and this is what you do here. So this is uh, how you have a real good control element for glycerol, but also for water. The water goes exactly along this channel that is optimal for the water. And, uh, and we also, I think, saw that for the ion channels uh, in, in nerve cells, they also use this inverted helices. OK, so now you see how the glycerol goes through there. And so look at it. So there is a very narrow spot here where the glycerol is being uh, uh, checked. So the old days at the airport, they checked you, touch your body, today they are sort of, I don't know, homophobic or whatever, they don't want to touch you anymore, so they just make it with machinery, but, uh, but nature here doesn't have the problem, it just touches it to find out if it's the right one. And what does it find out? You will be very, very surprised what the beautiful trick they found here to make sure it's a glycerol. Before I show you, we go a little bit further and look a little bit more closer up. So here we see that, and when you are, when what we are looking at, we look at the dipole moment of the glycerol. The glycerol has these red, white molecular groups there. Those are OH groups. They all carry a dipole moment. And what we are plotting here as the glycerol goes through there is the dipole moment of the glycerol. And so we have this quadrupolar field, and now you see what the, what the, dip, what the glycerol is doing. It has the dipole moment in this direction. And then it gets the dipole moment in the opposite direction. Now, every molecule can do that. The molecule comes, fat molecule rotates around like a boat, like an ocean liner goes like this. 
but you see there's very little space here. No rotation of the molecule. The molecule has to, has to turn its dipole moment on the spot like this. And you know how glycerol can do it? Very simple. The glycerol has an OH group. OH, it just goes like this. OH. And very, very small motion. It has three OH groups, and so that way it can, can twist its dipole moment, and uh, thereby, on, on the smallest possible uh, place, it can, uh, it can uh, rotate it and uh, get through. And, and other molecules have to, as a whole, move around like an ocean liner, and there's no space for them. They don't make it through. Here you see how this was actually done by Loomis student. Uh, um, Paul Grayson, who developed an interactive way of, of pulling on the computer the glycerol through this channel and thereby seeing exactly what is happening with a beautiful experiment. Okay, good. So now we are back at the sequence and now we would like to do the sequence analysis. So now you have to pay attention because that will be your final, will be your final. And so, um, so we would like to, to, to do, do a sequence analysis of, of, uh, of um, aqua points. Now, if you want to compare A to B, first we need A, then we can compare to B. What we actually want to do, we want to compare A to B to C to D to E, but first we need something to compare. So we have to find somewhere on the web uh, uh, an aqua point. So there are many places to find aquaporin, and we go here to um, the, the program, uh, the, the website uh, that, that is doing this comparison and, and getting your protein information. And now I tell you how to use those websites. And so I, I, I hope I was really up to date. This is website change always slightly. They don't change big. They change sort of slightly, just like so you will see no screenshots how, how I did it. But it could be that we will do that tonight again. And we want to be sure that when you do it on your computer, you get exactly the same screenshot I show you here. So uh, to, to make it really easy on you. But if there is a little difference, it's a small difference. Like basically with a little looking around and judging, you can, you can help yourself. So, so be prepared that we send you new screenshots so that, you know, very, very little variation that is really exactly like it and maybe for some reason your computer shows a little different. Don't worry. Just try to be practical about it. But of course you can also send us an email and ask us. Okay, so first we have to find an, an, a sequence and we go here to the website. It's called SwissProt. You know, the Swiss make a lot of money with pharmaceuticals, so they have a very uh, generous and pharmaceutical industry, and they, they uh, fund this website called Swiss Prot, Swiss Protein, and so there's an address. And you go, you type in that address, and then you do, do hit return, and, uh, and there you go, you're getting this page. Now this can, for example, change a little bit. And, but now you are going here and you find here something that reads like this. Where you have the Uniprot website and you click there because that is uh, the website where you see all these protein sequences. And you see these are all some other things that obviously not what you want to do. You want to just get this Uniprot website. Okay, so you click on it and then you are getting uh, this, uh, this picture. And now you, now you, uh, uh, in Uniport you have lots of databases with slightly different materials, and we want to choose uh, the protein database that is called Uniport KB. So that's what you have to choose. And um, so you select it, and then you give the name of your protein. You can write aquaporin, do it, there will be no harm. Uh, you can also be really brief, AQP, and it understands uh, lab jargon, so you put in your protein name, and then you click search. And now it looks for all the proteins that are related to that name in the database and, uh, and gives you the sequences. 
So we, we click it and now we, it searches for them and here we have um, there we have several lists. Now this, bet, this uh, database tells you a lot about the protein. If you go there and click now any of the entries, you're learning a lot about papers written, properties of the protein, pharmacological uh, uh, relationships for it, and so on and so on. So it's, it's a long list of, 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 of information you learn. At this moment, we are only interested in the sequence because we want to compare the sequence of one aqua point to those of other aqua points. For example, we want to find all 10 human aqua points and compare them. So then you go here, you see here, uh, the list you get is starting with the human aqua point, aqua point two. And so let's say we take this one, and you click on the first entry, and then it tells you the properties of that entry. So a long list of properties, and the sequence is sort of like the last one. Not the last one, but you know, it's, it's not at the, at the top there. First it gives you papers and the name of the protein and under which conditions it's stable and what its function is. But then when you scroll down, you get into the sequence. And it puts a sequence here. See the first the 10 amino acid, the next 10 amino acid, and so on. Very nice, very good for the eye. You know, you can read, if you look for number 155, you go here, you have 155, very good, but not for the computer. For the computer, you want the sequence all in one line without interruptions. And so, uh, so this is why you now uh, uh, take a different format that's good for the computer, not for your eyes, it's called FASTA. That is uh, the, the standard format, and you, you click on FASTA, and then it gives you this. This is the next, the next uh, screenshot. And now you see the same, but all at the continuous line. And these are the one-letter codes. I show them in a, in a, in a second um, uh, to remind you what these one-letter codes are standing for. These are the one-letter codes for the 20 amino acids. So you see MWE, MWE, last one, TKA, TKA. So it's, it's the same, but this one you can now uh, cut out, and now you can use it for, for sequence uh, uh, alignment. So you cut it, and now you keep it, and now you go to this other database that is um, in the NCBI database, there where you can get the sequence comparison. So we just got to the Swiss protein database. We got, uh, we put in, we would like to have this protein co called in the lab jargon AQP. Tell me what you, what you have and you have a long list of them. You just pick the first one because it's a human one. You say, oh, why don't we take a human one? And uh, then you go down to the, you're getting all the properties of this particular protein and at the bottom there is also the, the sequence. And then you're getting, however, the sequence in faster format so that you can uh, use it for the, as an entry for sequence comparison. So the sequence comparison is now, of course, the harder part that we go to. And the sequence comp comparison is done at this, at this uh, 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 address, and that is um, NCBI. National Center for Biological Information, that actually a um, center funded by the National Institutes of Health in the United States, a very, very famous big database with all many, many kind of information. And uh, so we, we click on this to go to this particular database. And here we are. This is what we get. And uh, now uh, the database lets us do many things. Uh, many more than you want to know about. What we want to do is a sequence comparison, and that is uh, done with an algorithm that was coined uh, the name of the, it, uh, the name of which was coined BLAST. Probably it stands for something, but I don't know what it stands for. Sorry, and uh, it's very very common. So if you if you go across Green Street uh, to the biologist, probably you will hear the word BLAST when you just go through the corridors, you know, 10 times, uh, if you just walk through, oh, did you blast already this? Did you blast already that? That's what they do all the time, and they compare sequences. 
So, so I showed you lots of structures. When we have about today in the protein database 100,000 structures, but we have many, many, many more sequences. So the sequence databases contain you know, much more treasures, and so uh, blasting is really extremely common activity. So we want to blast. And so we tell them, they'll tell this uh, National Center for Biological Information database, please let me blast. So you click on that. Okay, so then you go, and this is what you get. You're getting now um, the blast uh, page. And now what do you want to blast? Uh, basic blast, yeah, we want to, of course, we want to do basic. Do we want to do nucleotide? Just to, do we want to compare DNA sequences? No, we want to do compare amino acid sequences that you do with protein blast. So we put, we click on protein blast so that we can now click our protein sequence. Remember that we cut and paste the sequence of aquaporin 2, human aquaporin 2, so that's still in your computer, don't lose it, and uh, because we need it now. But now, when we go protein blast, we are being greeted with a window where we can put our sequence uh, that we want to, com to which we want to compare our sequence in the database. So we put it there. And then we uh, could now click and say do it, but when you compare, then you actually use an algorithm. And that algorithm makes certain assumptions, and since we are thinking people here in Lumis Lab, we want to know what assumptions they make. And so um, they are being sort of specified through certain parameters for the blast search. And so just to give you an idea where you see those specified, you go here, algorithmic parameters. And so you click there. At the moment, we don't do anything with it because we want to get our result. But you click there, and then you are seeing here choices that you thresholds, word size, some very important metrics, and so on. You could change it by going there. You can choose this instead of another one. Of course, you don't want to do it now. You're glad that somebody put it there, and you say, oh, default, default. But I just would like to tell you that you know when you know a little bit more, even after I will finish my lecture today, you know when a little bit more, you might actually vary it. But at this moment, uh, we don't want to be glad that they, somebody put the default value, so we say blast. So now we blast our sequence. That's the language they use across Green Street. So we blast. And then we are getting something that looks like this. We are getting, we, have a, we made a query. We put in a sequence. We don't see much yet. But then it starts with some colors. And uh, if you see lots of red, then, oh, you are in, in heaven, because red means you're getting sequences that look very close. The system doesn't know that yours was than, more than uh, an aquaporin. So you can put a random sequence there. You are, you know, maybe you are drunk with your friends. You play a game tonight in the bar, and everybody can put the next amino acid. And then, uh, then uh, tomorrow morning, when you uh, when when the headache is gone, you you blast for it, and you will find out what kind of randomness that you generated there if it, that it was already sometimes uh, um, played with in, the, in evolution. Okay, so you're getting a lot of red, looks very good, and now you go uh, where the real results are. These are sort of like color-coded results. I told you when it's red, it's good, not bad. And so now we go when black is, is bad. Red is the best. And pink or whatever that color is, uh, is not so good. Green is middle, and black is real bad. OK, so now you go then where the real results are. And now when we go there, we, we click now here, then here we see lots of results, and they are being scored. They are being scored here by, here you see, uh, agreement. And uh, when you click on one of the results and you find more details, how close they agree. And so this is pretty much at the top. So if I go back here, um, then you know it starts here with a, with a score of 545. And so we, 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 we went a little down. I don't know why I went here. I forgot, but this is another aqua point. This is 
a, a human aquaporin 5, so probably I wanted to look for the next uh, a human aquaporin, and then I just went pretty randomly to find a human aquaporin. And now I click and I say, okay, compare this one to my, to my uh, aquaporin 2 human that I gave you before. So you, 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 you choose it, and now you're getting the comparison. So you're getting some statistics, the score, you're getting sort of like the probability value, uh, whatever that means, not so important. More important are uh, these ones, identities, positives, and gaps. And so basically what they tell you is that uh, you have here your, your query that you put in that we started out with, and this is now the one that we selected, and now you compare them. And you have aligned them, the system has aligned them, and now you see every time an amino acid is, is mentioned here, then you have the same on the top and on the bottom. So those are, you call them identities, where you have the same sequence. So we, we see there's a lot of identical amino acids in this case, and so comparison is obviously a reasonable lot of identical, namely 65% uh, are identical. If you are in the business, uh, like if, if a student comes to me and says, oh, professor, I don't know the structure of this protein, you want me to simulate. Yeah, but did you compare it with this protein that is structurally known? Uh, yes, yes, I compared. And it's only 65% identical. I said, are you crazy? I would say 65% fantastic, it's basically the same. So up to 50%, they're really close. They're basically the same protein structure, right, and so on, and below 50, 30% is still pretty good, but then it sort of fizzles out a little. So we're getting here identities. Positives are either identical or the same kind of amino acids. And some amino acids are polar, non-polar, positive charged, negative charged, and so then we have the same amino acid. Then we make a plus here. So here we have a leucine and a valine plus same type of uh, hydrophobic amino acid. And now we see that, um, that positives we are getting 81%. So we see really when we have a replacement not identical, it's pretty close. And now this is sort of like the bad information. Is there a gap? Is there is this protein that we that we compare with maybe twice as long as our original sequence, or some piece is missing, or some piece is longer? No, it's a zero percent, exactly the same length. Really fine comparison, but very often you have some gaps, and if you have your ten percent gaps, particularly if the gap size the end is not too bad. Okay, so here you, here you see how you can live with this information. So you have to really be impressed. This is a language that evolution uses when it makes life. That's a language. That's where they play. Nothing else. And we have a huge amount of sequences in the database that we can look at and that we can analyze. So this is an incredible treasure in depth, the meaning, the very meaning of life is there, and also in practicality, we have lots of data that we can, uh, that we can utilize. So now we, have, uh, now we would like to know how do they do that. Now I have only sort of five more minutes, but I think I almost can make it. So we have here the amino acids, and we have to represent them as close as possible. So we have here the amino acid, here are the three letter codes, and here are the one letter codes. And we have to use the one letter codes in order to really get the comparison concise. Everything else would be more complicated. We have to remember a little bit what these one letter codes stand for, but then the, the formalism is much easier. And so now we would like to compare one sequence against the other sequence. And the way we do it is that we define a function that has a high value when the comparison is good. You call it an objective function. And the objective function, you want to, you know, you have all kinds of things. For example, you want to optimize your income, then you can make an objective function for your income. If you optimize it, you have the best income you can possibly have. And so here we have many, many possible sequences that we have to search for. We need to be systematic. We define an objective function. 
And the objective function is defined here recursively because we, when we look at the sequence, we compare one, then or compare the next, then the next, then the next, so it goes recursively from one, two, three, four. We can compare. And now we have the, there we have two strategies. When we want to compare, we have to say this sequence, for example, this sequence might be shorter than this sequence. Uh, we could say, here's an amino acid missing that is here. So we would like to say, at this point, we want to assume it lost an amino acid relative to mine. You call it a gap. Or you could say, oh, no, this, this amino acid corresponds to this one. So how you, how you arrange them, and where you assume they might have lost some or gained some, you call a gap. And so either you say the next comparison had a gap, then when we go from step i minus 1 to step i, we are, uh, sorry, then we are putting a gap penalty. Then we say, oh, gap, but gap is not so good. We give it a penalty. Same penalty we give when we add an extra amino acid. So here, for example, we added amino acids. Then we have insertion penalty. Here we have deletion penalty. So either you say we have more or fewer, and then you have a gap. Or we say we compare them. If they are exactly the same, then you're getting a plus. And if they, are, um, if they are different, then you're getting a minus. And if they are very different, you're getting a real minus. You say, oh, these ones have nothing to do with each other. And so you have here what you call a substitution matrix that tells you how, how much you can substitute one amino acid by another one. Of course, the best is you substitute one amino acid by the same amino acid. Then you're getting the best, uh, the best substitution value. But you know, you can also take a similar one, you still get a good value. But if you substitute one amino acid by a totally different amino acid, then you're getting a real penalty minus value. So that's how you go. You make an insertion or deletion. Or you'd say, oh, now I want to say these two amino acids really should be comparable. And then you're getting a substitution value that is good when they are very similar or not. So this is how it is. You, can, you have to read it yourself. It's all there, pretty straightforward. Now let's look at this substitution matrix. So here we have the substitution matrix that we are putting here. For the gap value, we assume minus 6. So we have some units. And so in our units, gap is not so good. So we give it minus 6, whatever minus 6 unit means. And now we have, accordingly to this gap value, Minus six is all like minus penalty, you know, six unit points you lose. Now we have the substitution matrix has to use the same values, the same units. So here we see. And now we look at this substitution matrix. That tells you how we can replace one amino acid by another one. And now let's look at it. We have an, we have an arginine, replace it by an arginine. These are again here. These are the 20 amino acids. Here we have some extra ones, and those 10 four cases where actually they couldn't be resolved in the, in the sequence. That happens sometimes, and then you have to do something with it. Ignore those. OK, so if we take an arginine, and we, come, and we have in the other sequence an arginine plus 9. Bingo, really good. If you look around here, go on the diagonal, 16 is a cytosine. Cytosine is very, very special. So here they get a 16, here getting a 9, here getting a 9. So these really li like each other. Here find some, they hate each other a little bit. Like 7, uh, that is a, um, what is it, E, E, glutamate, no, glutamate. Glutamate, they eh? don't like each other that much. Let you see where they like each other the least. The 6 are here, isoleucine, leucine. Um, uh, this one is uh, uh, lysine. So they don't like each other that much. Let me see, well, here, here we have one, here, he needs to go to the psychi psychiatrist, five. Well, that is a serine, serine has a problem with itself. Uh, five, here, two more fives. Oh no, these are these special ones. So you see that some of them like each other a lot. They, I only want to be replaced by myself. I think the tryptophan, let me see, where we have the highest value here, let's go. Which one W, yeah, where is it? W here. 19, 19, see? 
that is a very big one. That wants to be itself, like an elephant wants to be replaced by an elephant. So nothing else is good for me. And now you can see also that some amino acids can be replaced by others. Like, uh, like here, this is an aspartate. Uh, okay, by itself, by itself, and here, six. Six is, oh, it's one of those unknown ones, that doesn't count. So what is the next best, so you would say glutamate. Glutamate would be nine, here, two. So only positive value, two with the glutamate. Yeah, so glutamate is a little shorter than an aspartate. But I know glutamate is a little longer than aspartate, but so otherwise negative, negative. So let's uh, let's go to another one. Uh, let's take um, uh, take let's take the leucine. A leucine likes itself not too much. Um, likes to be also replaced by either isoleucine or by methionine. And so you see that, you see that there's real life going on there. People really studied them through a lot of statistics. They found which, which amino acids can be replaced by others. And so now you can use them now to, to construct now between two amino acid sequences the best comparison. And so here we have this sequence. And this sequence, we would like to compare them. You see, this one is longer than that, so we have to we have to add some gaps there. And so here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, four, so we have to have two gaps. And so now what we do is we first assume that right away we, we, we start with a gap. That we have one gap, two gaps, three gaps, four gaps. That means that we, that we, uh, we don't want to even compare, we say that that you know, they like each other at the beginning so little that they don't want to be compared with each other. Uh, basically, this guy said, ah, you are so awful. I don't want to be compared with any of the amino acids. The other one said the same. That would be these values. It obviously, must be pretty bad. And now we fill in the rest with values that give us an objective function that tells us how good, in terms of the value of the objective function, the comparison would be. And so here we say, we want to compare an M with an M. This is a substitution matrix. And you see an M, M gets a 5, so we put a 5. Now, if we would say the next one, we want to make a gap, we don't want to compare it. We're getting a minus 6 penalty, so we're getting minus 1. If we say we, we, we insert an amino acid, we also get the penalty of minus six, we're getting a minus one. But when we say instead, oh, the next one is a, is a glycine. My god, this is fantastic. I like a glycine. The glycines like, it, like each other. Glycine, glycine, six. We add a five, a six, getting 11. So here we have hit, methionine, methionine fit, glycine, glycine fit, we're getting an 11. And so this way you can fill in the values by either saying, oh, let's make a gap, or let's, let's, let's put the next amino acid on top of each other. If you do that, you're getting, you're getting the values put. And so you end up with an 11 here. And now you can go back by always going the optimal path back. And then you find out oh, this one was my comparison. This is how I, how I do it. I, I go M with, here for the final, the final one. M with M, G with G, then I make a gap here. Then K with K, a gap here, and then P with P. That's the best you can get. And so that is how, the, how it works. And you need a gap penalty, and you need a substitution matrix that tells you the key properties of either making gaps or comparing an amino acid. It seems like the gap penalty, like the substitution matrix penalties, uh, would, would have some kind of dependence on the thing Ab that was being... Absolutely, yes, the same units. They are, they, are, they are absolutely linked to each other. Okay. So they're, they are one thing. I, I first explain one, then the other, but not because they're separate, but they are really one unit. And now you can choose, you know, many people come up with, with with, with this one, when you go to your, 
to your blast surge, then they have a blow sum. This is how they're called, blow sum, substitution matrix. I forgot which I showed you here. I think probably when I put it here, I even have the name there. Um, here, blow sum 40 matrix. And I think uh, the one that is a, the, the, on, on the blast search, the, the default is blow sum 58, I think I remember. So then you can compare it. And so then here is then the tutorial that tells you how to do these things. And so you can work through the, uh, the, 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 the case study, work through them, and, and apply it. And so that very easy, too easy problem for you that we put in the final, so you don't really have to worry there. But you one time you're getting, you make a real encounter with sequence information. OK, good. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, the last lecture then. Unfortunately, I got too much in a, in a rush to, 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 that I couldn't think of a good uh, quotation, the to, to one to put your, what, what did you do, put your brain in the computer or a computer in your brain? <laughs> I don't know how to, how to top that. Uh, and, uh, I'm, I'm not sure you could. That's, that's pretty crazy. But uh, I do actually have one question that is pertinent to reality, um, which is the final exam. It's, it's released on Thursday and then it's due... By the end of the, of the final week. Oh, so by Saturday of next week. Yes, yes, by the end of the final week. I don't want to say yes because I don't know when the final week ends. Yeah. But you have the whole week time at the end you give us the exam back. You can give us the exam back any, any time, but you have to give it back by, by that. And I'm pretty sure we write it on the, on the final. We tell you when it has to be back where. But you have the whole week. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, good. Nice um, teaching to you and I... Hope we run into each other again and I hope you learn some.